I always head up to Baguio whenever I want to cool off. A small city located in the Cordillera Mountains north of the Philippines, Baguio is one of the country's most favored summer getaways. With its pine trees and foggy air, it is quite a postcard image that lures both local tourists and foreign backpackers. In March, just when the temperature was starting to rise in Manila, I took the Midnight Express bus to Baguio to take part in the 20th anniversary of the Café by the Ruins, probably the country's longest-running artist-run space. Founded by members of the Baguio Arts Guild and other friends, the café is literally built upon the ruins of the former residence of the governor of Bengay. I remember Santiago Bose, one of the café's co-founders and leaders of the guild, telling me that Baguio locals never paid much attention to artists. They perceived artists as good-for-nothings, just idling away with the drinking and other vices. They were proved wrong when a powerful earthquake hit the city in the early 90s, flattening everything and causing widespread destruction. The Baguio artists were one of the first groups to mobilize help, opening the cafe as a soup kitchen for the hungry and homeless. Since then, the artists in Baguio have gained respect and cafe has become an iconic place for the community. Almost all of the people who played a part in the cafe were there on the first day of the celebration. More than an event, it was a get-together of artists and friends, a time to unwind, catch up and reminisce a homecoming. It was so nice to see Sue Clamado, the real, mama, of the cafe, who flew in from the US. Where she has been living for the past few years, just to organize the anniversary. Just like old times. You sent. Sue was there, all smiles, offering food, while the sound of brass gongs and bottles of tapui, homebrewed rice wine, welcomed everybody. A bullol, the ubiquitous symbol of the Cordillera, carved in pink ice, presided over the dape, an outdoor circular platform where elders meet. There were also collaborative outdoor installations made by young local artists. Works by founding members of the guild lined the wall inside the cafe. But it was the board full of photos of the cafe, the artists and the happenings throughout the years that was probably the most meaningful. It was history. In the evening, Showman Shaman, a documentary on Roberto Villanueva, was shown. Everyone was quiet. In this part of the world, silence does not mean indifference but deep respect. Villanueva was truly one of Baguio's visionary artists, combining indigenous culture with the contemporary. He played the role of a shaman well, touching lives of people from the Lahar affected Ita communities in central Luzon, Philippines, to the well healed urbanites in New York. He died in 1995, as he was planning on making a monumental acupuncture needle to heal the earth. Towards the end of the film, there was an interview with Santiago Bose talking about the profound influence of Villanueva on the Baguio art community. Bose is another pillar of the guild as instrumental in the organization of the Baguio Arts Festival from the 80s to early 2000s. The festival was a very successful initiative that drew international participation even before the idea of biennales became common in the Southeast Asian region. Like Villanueva, Bose was able to incorporate traditional leitmotifs in contemporary work, strongly laced with humor and sardonic wit. He died in 2003, a year after the last festival. On the second day, there was a Thanksgiving canal, a ritual feast involving the sacrifice of a few pigs. It's a gory affair that was quite difficult to explain to my six-year-old daughter, who asked me why God would be happy with animal killing. Coincidentally, curator Okui Enweza was recently questioned for including a work by Adele Abermest, which showed the image of an animal being beaten to death, in an exhibit in San Francisco. He had to remove the work due to pressure by animal rights activists. Such are examples of cultural differences that need understanding. You sent musical performances by two groups capped the evening. It was a good study in contrast. The first group called Open Space Productions, led by Carlo Altamont and Ferdi Balanag, did a comic repertoire on sex, drugs and rock and roll while the older Pinakpikan group, named after a local dish maid, Again, with a chicken beaten to death, jammed, mixing traditional and modern instruments to come up with a crossover global sound. Unfortunately, I missed Yasin Banal's After Andromeda performance, since I left early. It was a poetic memoir to the 
cafe made with recorded narratives and sound played inside. The cars parked outside the cafe's entrance. Before heading down to Manila, I took time just to walk around Baguio. Yes, much has changed throughout the years. Even the locals admit it. Overdevelopment is a real threat, represented by the huge SM mall that stands at the top of Session Road, the city's main street, overshadowing the convention center, which was the venue of the Baguio Arts Festival for many years. Also on Session Road, the Victor Oteza Community Art Space, VOCAS, owned by filmmaker Kidlet Tahimik, could be full of promise. There was a photo exhibit by a young artist when I dropped in. But Kidlet was not there and these days his energies are more concentrated in building his home higher up in the mountains far from the city. Everyone seems to be moving on. One has to realize something particular about Baguio. Traditionally, communities are led by the elders, who gather around the dapes, charting and deciding the future of their kin. What happens when the elders are gone? Just like the ice bowl all in the cafe's dape that melted away even before the celebration ended. All that's left are the traces and fleeting reminders of what has been. I put on my coat and head to the bus, cooled off, but feeling that I am missing something.